It took a military surgeon, Dr. Albert J. Meyer, to make some real advances in tactical signaling. He'd worked with sign language for the deaf while a student at Buffalo Medical College, and then extended it for use in the field through his semaphore system. Of course, this made the visible messages an open secret to both friend and foe. Dr. Meyer, eventually commissioned General Meyer, received approval from Congress to command a section of the Army. It was to be known henceforth as the Signal Corps. That was in 1863. During the Civil War, Colonel Anson Stagger, U.S. Signal Corps, deployed a network of telegraph lines that stretched all the way from the Gulf to the commanding general in the War Department. Sherman and Grant spoke to one another. Let me send back all my wounded and unserviceable men and with my effective army move through Georgia. Answer quick, as I know we will not have the telegraph long. On reflection, I think better of your proposition. It will be much better to go south than to be forced to come north. Once the war was over, new technical developments appeared during the aftermath. Alexander Graham Bell and his incredible invention. Now the Signal Corps had its first real far-reaching weapon. We put it to use in the Spanish-American War and then took all the wires away. Tremendous in terms of saving time and mobility. But now everyone could listen in. So the art of coding and decoding became important. Alaska then became the Corps' biggest challenge. Someone was needed to put in phone lines through the ice and tundra and over the mountains. It was called the Washington, Alaska Military Cable and Telegraph System. The airplane was to have a profound impact on the Signal Corps' mission. An air machine was to be built that would be capable of carrying a pilot, one passenger, at 40 miles per hour. Well, the Wright brothers built it. It moved at a record-breaking 42 miles per hour. A radio was installed in it. On August 1, 1907, Brigadier General James Allen, Chief Signal Officer, set up the Aeronautical Division. When we got into World War I in 1917, Electrical communications made possible the control of tactical activities from a single source. Theoretically, it became feasible to set huge forces into motion and keep track of them. For the most part, though, infantry brigades still relied on buzzers, messengers, and visual signaling. But wire did make a conspicuous appearance. Thousands of miles of telephone lines were strung through the trenches on both sides. Wooden cross arms and circuits proliferated. During the Meuse-Argonne offensive, we used 2,500 miles of wire per week. A doughboy recalled his experience and wrote, when the hell begins, signal contact becomes a man's lifeline. Without it, he is blinded, sent stumbling forward against shadows that may be friendly or not. Without a link to those with a similar mission, he slows down to find his bearings. The unseen enemy grows in his mind, seems to come up behind him, and ultimately blocks his ability to understand. The aviation section belonged to the Signal Corps and had 55 planes in flying condition. But the war increased the number of our Signal Corps flyers from 75 to 11 and a half thousand. By the time the war ended, the Army had 50 field signal battalions and 28 telegraph battalions. The troops came home. Camp Vale in New Jersey became Fort Monmouth and the Signal Corps settled there. And then the air section requiring autonomy became the Army Air Corps. Curiosity and inventiveness continued and technological advances did take place. 
not many people were aware of the role that the Signal Corps played in the new technologies which were to benefit all the people. Ground-to-air transmitters and receivers were improved, indispensable to civilian air traffic. Wireless ranges were increased from 100 to 250 miles, an important factor in forthcoming events. Radar, bouncing radio waves off moving objects to locate them, made its appearance. The need for a rapid, reliable, global military signaling system had not yet become fully apparent. But the German march across Europe got people to think. Warfare, mechanized and airborne, had suddenly become fluid. Entire armies racing across vast distances would have to maintain communications networks. The Signal Corps had its visionaries but most couldn't sense the urgency of new ideas. Then one day, a Signal Corps sergeant spotted the approach of a large flight of planes. Calibrating 130.3 east of north of Oahu and closing. There's a lot, reading more than 20, maybe double that. A warning communique left the mainland, but arrived seven hours late. When we got into the thick of World War II, Major General Horace Fuller said, the Chief of Staff and myself have a limited knowledge of Signal Corps equipment. When signal communications function properly, as we expect they will, expect no praise. But should they fail, expect plenty of hell. The Pacific Theater soon proved to be the first real test of Signal Corps ingenuity and endurance. There were some lessons to be learned in getting equipment ashore and getting it to work while hot metal was flying around overhead. Line of sight contact could be maintained for a while, but as forward positions began to stretch inland, wireless teams would have to go into action. Some wouldn't make it. Signal Corps experience was rapidly being seasoned for the unbelievably complex task of landing in Europe. This was Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa at the end of 42. Signal traffic told the story.
photographs of the first desperate moments at Normandy and Omaha in France were taken to England by Signal Corps pigeons. The entire world saw them. The Signal Corps had immediately set up a 400 watt transmitter that could span the ocean to a press wireless receiving station on Long Island. Many New Yorkers got the news as it was happening. And then a new problem surfaced. Trucks and track vehicles chewed up surface phone lines about as fast as they were laid down. It became an endless round of install and repair what had just been installed. Armies had never before experienced anything as massive as this. Signal Corps mobile radio broadcasting units trained in psychological warfare went into action in the front lines to convince pockets of Germans to surrender without firing additional shots. It was Signal Corps intelligence that ultimately broke the most difficult enemy codes, providing frontline commanders with the kind of edge that would save lives. And then came Bastogne. The great German offensive began to take shape in the Ardennes. To break it would require the coordination of a number of major counter moves. So, 3rd Army signalmen set out to build a vast new communications network using some 20,000 miles of field wire. Wireless transmissions were extended outward over hundreds of miles to keep up with this desperate rescue. The radio call sign for General Patton? Lucky. Forward. Patton's troops finally relieved the besieged town, and the sweep across France, Belgium, and Holland to the German border went into its final phase. It was in October of 1944 that General Douglas MacArthur came back to the Philippines. Major General Spencer Aiken, in charge of the Signal Corps, and Lieutenant Colonel Abe Schechter organized what was later recognized as an important forerunner of instant global communications. From their radio signal truck on the beach, they made it possible for General MacArthur to broadcast these words beyond our first combat lines in the Philippines. This is the voice of freedom. General MacArthur speaking. People of the Philippines, I have returned. By the grace of Almighty God, our forces stand again on Philippine soil, soil consecrated in the blood of our two people. We have come, dedicated and committed, to the task of destroying every vestige of enemy control over your daily lives and of restoring upon a foundation of indestructible strength, the liberties of your people. As the war in Europe drew to a close, a commander of one Signal Corps battalion wrote, Mussolini dead, Hitler dead, Goebbels a suicide, but it's no holiday for this headquarters. Communications duty continues and will increase as the new staging area expands. The final signal from the Supreme Commander reads, To the Combined Chiefs, the mission of this Allied force was fulfilled at 0241, local time, May 7th, 1945. The June 1948 Berlin airlift was our answer to the Russian attempt to starve that city out of the Western world. As many as 9,000 tons of essentials a day were delivered to the over 2 million people of Berlin. Such vast logistics demand an extraordinarily complex and yet efficient communication system. The Signal Corps supplied it and also established RIAS radio in the American sector to counter Russia's vicious propaganda. And then came Korea, Bloody Ridge, Chosin Reservoir, the Chungbon Mountains, Jinju, Seoul, Pork Chop Hills. 
For the Signal Corps, it meant installing tactical transmission lines through some of the roughest combat country in the world. Where possible, cable plows were used to submerge lines underground, and earth auger trucks were employed to dig post holes. Air ground combat operations achieved unusual effectiveness through highly improved tactical communication systems. And then it ended at Panmunjom. By the time the events in Indochina had turned into full-scale war, it had become possible for men and women in the field to make direct contact with their commanders in the states. Actions taken thousands of miles away could be monitored and evaluated as they occurred. Events in a remote part of the world could now reach across all time zones through direct dialing, data transmission, through satellites used as instant relays to people with a need to know. Research and development produced a whole new world of unattended ground sensor devices. Unmanned ground radar units were installed for tactical early warning missions. Signals that required a telegraph train in Civil War days could now be received in the palm of a man's hand. Part of the reason is the U.S. Army Signal School at Fort Gordon, Georgia, the largest school of military communication in the world. Over 20,000 students train here annually. Programmed and computer-assisted instruction keep the Signal students up to date on the latest technology. The Media Center allows students to view visual training material and use hands-on training equipment. Thousands of instructional programs are produced here for the students and signal units around the world. The school's field training exercises teach students to overcome communication problems caused by adverse conditions. Through a quarter century of growth and expansion, the school has kept pace with the technological evolution of military communication and equipment. The Signal School stands dedicated to training soldiers for the communication needs of today and tomorrow. Where to from here? A fully portable, totally modularized, comprehensive communications system is already on the drawing board. How much farther is there to go? No one can predict. Whatever the future holds, the country can look to the Signal Corps to be ahead of whatever comes next. <laughs>